Welcome to episode 14 of the Money Scope podcast, shining a light deep inside personal finance for Canadian professionals. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, portfolio manager and head of research at PWL Capital and Dr. Mark Soth, aka The Looney Doctor. Yeah, in the last two episodes, we did a comprehensive review of how you can compensate yourself as a business owner uh, through a private corporation. So you can choose a salary and dividend mix each year to optimally do that over time uh, as the mix of current taxes and future taxes and tax planning uh, also enters into that equation. Today, we're going to take a deeper look into two of the payroll expense aspects that pretty much always come up in discussions with, uh, with your accountants or my accountant too, uh, the Canada Pension Plan or CPP and Employment Insurance or EI. As we mentioned in previous episodes, corporate business owners have the option of avoiding salary and contributing to CPP by, by not paying themselves a salary. But salary has a lot of advantages and, and the costs and potential advantages are actually much more complicated under the surface when, than what people see at first glance when they see you know how much it costs to contribute to CPP. Yeah, we really discovered that. And in writing those episodes, we found it was hard to find a really good analysis of the potential cost benefit of CCP of CPP and the newer enhanced CPP for business owners from a really practical standpoint. I had taken a crack at it a couple of years ago, but there's challenges trying to find an apples to apples comparison because CPP is a different type of product completely. And when we were talking about it, I think Ben got pretty excited because he he went away and came back with this model accounting for some more of the nuances. And as we discussed that uh, further, we pretty much found all sorts of other things that we really needed to look at when we're thinking about this. So quickly morphed into a a larger project. Yeah, yeah, it it really did. CPP is complex to model because there are tax credits and deductions that reduce the current cost after taxes. And then the other thing is that paying dividends to avoid CPP suffers from tax integration inefficiency. We talked about dividends being slightly less uh, favored by integration relative to salary. And then in addition to that, the return on CPP is not like a regular investment. It's not like a a stock or a bond because it hedges risks that other investments simply cannot hedge. So I think it has to be looked at differently from just comparing the rate of return, for example. So we're going to try and unpack that today. Uh, We we do want to acknowledge Aravind Sithamparapillai from Ironwood Wealth Management, who's done some great analysis on CPP and on, on EI, both tops we're going to talk about today. So he helped us out just giving feedback and ideas. Uh, and then I'm working on some analysis with him on CPP on the on, on the side as well. Uh, and then I also want to mention Jason Watt. He's one of the country's top CFP curriculum instructors. And he's done some really good thinking on EI. And his thinking on this kind of nudged us in, in, in the in the directions that we took our research and, uh, and thinking. As always, despite those acknowledgments, any errors are our own. Um, we're, we're the ones talking about it today. But those guys did bring us some great perspectives. Yeah. I mean, honestly, building this episode today changed my perspective on EI. Me too. Yeah. I mean, the knee-jerk response for most of us is to not opt in. And it was for me, I can tell you that right up front. However, it could actually make sense when you put together a bunch of different factors that are involved. Again, with both of these topics, it is important to discuss your plans for your specific situation with your tax specialist. However, as we've alluded to, this is not a widely discussed analysis. So it's a blend of current year costs, the bigger picture long term. So coming to the table armed with the information that we're going to discuss today could actually change that conversation substantially. So uh, with that preamble, let's just dive right in. All right, let's go on on CPP. So as we discussed in episode 12, payments into CPP are part of the overall equation when you decide to pay salary from your corporation as compensation. They're mandatory payments, and you have to pay both the employer and employee sides of the CPP contributions. And so that leaves less money to invest in the corporation relative to paying dividends. So those are the commonly cited reasons to avoid using salary. And, and sometimes a gut feeling that CPP is a bad deal for self-employed business owners, which we're going to dig more into. We don't think that's the case, that it's a bad deal. And we're going to address each of those issues and, uh, and explain why we don't necessarily agree with them. Yeah. So, okay, let's uh, start off with what you pay and, and what you get. So CT, CPP contribution is amount. I mean, the process of rolling out the enhancements that, we've, that are just coming out will be implemented by uh, 2025. And the enhancements are funded by higher contributions in it that will eventually result in a 33% uh, income replacement rate compared to the current 25% uh, base CPP uh, replacement rate. So 
There's also along with that a higher earning ceiling for enhanced CPP, so you can pay a little bit more and get a little bit more. And that's important. The enhanced contributions are being phased in now, but the enhanced benefits will start phasing in uh, moving forward. So as, you, as we pay more now, we expect more down the road. Uh, the full 33% replacement rate will be for people taking the benefit uh, about 40 years from now. But between now and then, it's not like it's money lost. Uh, people will get some combination of basic and enhanced CPP, depending on how much they actually contributed in uh, to each parts of the plan. And again, what you get is related to what you paid. Those getting a larger income stream will have paid more into the pension. So that the maximum combined employer and employee contribution for 2025 is expected to be $8,848. That's a big headline number, and we're going to dig more into that in, uh, in, in a bit. So it, it, is, it is important to keep in perspective. Uh, that, that's a significant number for, for a, a, a business owner with a moderate income. And for any, any Canadian, that's a big amount of, uh, of, por- of forced savings. For someone with a very high income and a high savings rate, it's kind of a smaller proportion of the overall mix of money that they're that they're putting away, but it's still not insignificant. Uh, sal- salary also goes hand in hand. We have to keep in mind with other options for your longer term tax planning, like RSPs and, and IPPs. So that that's we talk about CPP with respect to paying salary, and it, even if someone thinks that CPP is a downside, which we're going to continue to dig into, but even if you had that belief, foregoing salary also means foregoing RSPs and and IPPs. Yeah, and those being tax shelters, that's that's giving up something important. So the question always comes up, you know, do, do business owners get a bad deal uh, with CPP? And part of what I think gets people piqued about CPP is the fact that it's mandatory. Mm-hmm. And that self-employed people also, you know, do they get a raw deal because they contribute double uh, what a regular employee sees deducted from their paycheck? You have to pay both the employer-employee uh, sides of the payment. Part of the confusion lies in that CPP was previously underfunded and, and not managed in a sustainable way as a pension. That that happened previously and I think left a bad bad sort of taste in people's mouths. That did change uh, with reforms back in the 1990s. And now CPP is managed like a pension and it's separate from the federal government. And pensions are managed in a different way. Pensions are managed to ensure that they have the funds to cover their future payment obligations. So that's really uh, the the bar that they're they're trying to achieve, and the CPP is actually really managed, uh, really well managed as a pension uh, using that type of measurement. Its most recent report showed that the pension obligations are met out past 2057 and are well funded. So, as a pension, it's 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 much better managed than when it was originally rolled out. The CPP has an incredible global rec- reputation. Like it is a really good uh, a really good uh, a really good plan. The it's still not fully funded. This the enhanced CPP is rolling out now is designed to be fully funded. Base CPP is partially funded, so it's uh, when when people get CPP payments, some of those come from new contributions from other members, and some of them come from investment returns from the the sort of endowment fund that they're that they're creating. But they are it, it's on a path to be fully funded. So it's anyway it's it's a very well designed, well run uh, pension plan. Business owners, I think, often feel like they're getting a bad deal with CPP because they're required to pay both the employer and the employee portion of the contribution, um, which which is true. And an employee just pays the employee side, but it kind of doesn't tell the whole story. When when the labor market sets wages for employees, employers are at least somewhat taking taking the cost of of employer CPP contributions into account. So if I'm hiring someone and, I, and I'm deciding how much I want to pay them in salary, I'm not just ignoring the fact that I have to pay into CPP as part of deciding how much I can afford to pay them as an employee. So in other words, well, business owners, self-employed people are, are explicitly paying both sides of CPP contributions. Employees of arm's length corporations, corporations that they're not closely related to, are, are implicitly paying both sides of the CPP through lower wages. So even though you're not, as an employee, seeing it on your, you know, uh, on, on your tax return, I guess, that you paid both sides, um, in reality, you, you got paid slightly less from your employer for the work that you did. Um, and that's kind of how you ended up paying 
at least a portion of the employer half of CVP as an employee. Empirically, and there has been some work done on this, um, that equilibrium is, is imperfect and employees in practice uh, empirically seem to bear somewhere between two thirds and 90% of social contributions like CPP. Yeah, that that data point is really important. People people don't believe me when I say that CPP is wrapped in someone's compensation package. They just don't believe it. I mean, as self-employed companies paying ourselves, we just see that transparently, but it, it's still buried in there for everyone else. It's not like people get a free ride. You could just expand a little bit more on that that data where it comes from, just so lends it some more background. Yeah, yeah. So that that statement that that uh, that employees end up absorbing the majority of social benefits contributions is based on a meta analysis of studies looking at countries around the world, and the meta analysis finds that the costs of social security or or CPP in Canada contributions are largely passed through to employees, mostly through reduced wages rather than reduced work hours. So one dollar of increased cost to the company for social contributions like this flowed through as 66 to 90 cents less wages for the employees. So I think the notion that the employer contribution is, is this like freebie that comes out of kind of thin air for employees and, and effectively a penalty for the self-employed, it doesn't really hold up empirically. I don't think it really holds up logically either, but the, the empirical part is, is what matters, I guess. Um, but in, in, in any case, as we discuss CPP throughout this episode, we are going to view it through the lens of paying both the employer and employee contribution. Th- that's how I've done all of my analysis on this. But even still, every time I post something about it, I get a lot of comments saying, well, you must only be looking at the employee portion. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> no, no. Um, but it is a very common, uh, probably one of the most common comments that I've gotten. I posted about this on YouTube. I posted about it on Twitter. And at least a few people every time I post about it say, like, great analysis, but too bad it doesn't apply for self-employed people. So, well, actually, it does. Uh, yeah. the, the other thing I want to mention here is that academic research, like when you look at published papers, uh, usually in journals in Canada, looking at CPP, they model total contributions from employees and employers when they're looking at things like the rate of return for, uh, on, on, on contributions. There's also a paper from the Fraser Institute on CPP. This one many times has been sent to me saying, uh, you must be doing the math wrong because look at this paper. They found a 2% uh, internal rate of return for an employee. I think that the language in that paper might just be confusing because they specified that they're looking at an employee, um, which leads people to to believe that it's a different result than what you get if you look at a self-employed person. But when you dig into that paper, they follow the methodology of a published academic paper and that published academic paper, if you go through their methodology, they're looking at both the employer and employee contribution as the cost of CPP. So all of those um, industry reports or whatever you call it, Fraser Institute, think tank reports is out there, um, and academic papers, they all kind of come, you use the same approach and, and come to similar, similar results, which we'll, we'll mention later. And so we're going to take the same approach here. We're going to think about the cost of CPP Regardless of your whether you're self-employed or an employee, the cost of CPP is the employer and employee combined contribution. And that, that's just the right way to think about it, I think. Yeah, I agree. And the other issue is people think of CPP as a tax when really you get what you get out of it is related to what you paid into it, which whereas we with taxes, you pay into the pot and it gets redistributed based on, you know, the government's decisions about how they want to redistribute it rather than being directly tied to your contributions. So CPP is different in that what you pay in is what you get. But it is important before we leave that topic to talk about a couple of times where it is actually kind of a wasted premium, which functionally is like a tax in the sense that you're paying extra in, but you're not going to get that out. So there are a couple of times when that can happen that it's usually a minor impact, uh, but it could be important for some people. If you have income from an external employer in addition to your own corporation, it is possible to contribute more than your annual maximum to CPP. And when that happens, you can get your employee side over contributions back on your personal taxes. However, the over contribution made by your your corporation and the external employer, if that goes over the amount, then that extra part doesn't get recouped. So if you have a case of multiple employers, you could end up paying a little bit more from your corporation uh, for the same benefits. Similarly, if you have already reached the maximum CPP benefit, 
based on past contributions. It actually takes quite a while at maximum contributions to do that. I'd very few people actually ever get there. But if that was your situation, further contributions wouldn't uh, come with additional associated benefits. The other thing to be aware of is that you know during years that you're raising children, the CPP benefit calculation allows you to drop low years of, of low income uh, due to raising a child under the age of seven, they can be excluded. And that may, that may mean, depending on your situation, making CPP contributions in those years, if they're not adding to the benefit, uh, they're not going to improve your situation despite some money paid into it. So in those situations, actually paying dividends may look more yep. favorable if you're doing one of those parental leaves uh, instead, just to avoid that situation. Although very few of us are going to hit the maximum amount. Yep. Anyways, in those those situations, the wasted contributions are a bit tax-like in that you're paying a bit more, but you're not getting more back for doing that. Yep. Yeah. So I, I, I want to keep going on that uh, on that is CPP a tax or or an asset? Because if you think about it as a tax, if you think about CPP as a cost then paying dividends can look a lot more attractive than salary because CPP effectively, if we view it as a tax, effectively increases the tax rate on salary yeah. by a, a not insignificant amount. Uh, but I, I, I'm going to argue, we're going to argue that's probably not the best way to, to think about CPP because when you make CPP contributions, they build entitlement to an inflation index annuity proportional to what you put in, like you said earlier, Mark. And that's not only an asset that's proportional to what you put into it, which makes it less like a tax. It's also a really valuable asset in its mm -hmm. own right because an inflation index annuity is not something that you can buy if you want to. Like you, you can, if you, if you have a pension, a defined benefit pension plan for an employer that has an inflation index benefit, that's one source. Most people don't have that. If you work for the federal government, that's another source. Most people don't work for the federal government. No. I Although... Mean yeah, more and like, more people are. Yeah, apparently. Uh, but I mean, no, no one else is willing to take on the risk because if you're going to have, yeah. basically you're, you're moving the risk from you and it's being moved on to someone else. And then no insurance company is going to want to do that. No employer is going to want to do that unless, you know, perhaps the government where they can change how much they collect in revenue uh, to, to cover unexpected liabilities. But no other employer wants to do this. So it's, as you mentioned, basically impossible or very difficult uh, to get access this type yeah. of asset yeah and, and cpp is not the government but they have a massive base that covers all of canada so one of the reasons that the government can take on real liabilities is because they have the most diversified revenue stream in the tax base of anybody nobody has a diversified revenue stream like the government does now again cpp is not the government but they have a very diversified base of contributors who are required to contribute into cpp uh, and they also have a, a, a time horizon that is effectively, at least theoretically, infinite, which again, mm -hmm. that's unlike any corporation, unlike any individual. So they're just in a different position in terms of being able to provide a, a real return to contributors. Anyway, so that, that's valuable. Uh, you, you can buy annuities in Canada. I know I got some pushback on this when I said the same thing on Twitter. Uh, somebody said, well, no, you can buy uh, inflation index annuities in Canada. I dug into that. I talked to people who work for insurance companies uh, and I'm happy to be proven wrong on this. I would love to get the data because then we could have pricing for what does it cost to buy this in the private sector, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't exist. And I did quite a bit of digging on it. Um, what I'm trying to say is you can buy fixed indexing annuities in Canada. So you can get like a 2% index annuity, but it's fixed at 2%. And inflation is not fixed at 2%, even if it's been 2% um, for a long time. But it, that doesn't account for like, if you have an 8% inflation year, a 2% index annuity does not respond to that. Now, why is it, why is an inflation index annuity important? It, it is the risk-free asset for a long-term investor. Cash is super risky for a long-term investor. It's not a risk-free asset. An inflation index annuity is the risk-free asset. So that's, that's worth something. Uh, so outside those special situations that you just mentioned, Mark, where CPP contributions are wasted and they're more tax-like, every contribution is going toward buying this this really valuable, useful retirement asset. Yeah, so CPP is not is more of an asset than a tax. And not only that, it's actually a desirable and hard to come by asset. However, the other criticism that comes up 
is from people who feel that they don't need risk mitigation. You know, they want to take as much risk as possible and putting money towards CPP takes it away from other riskier investments. They don't, you know, need any safety net. So how does how does CPP stack up as an investment in terms of risk and return? That's an important question for that crowd. Yeah, that's that's the other common pushback, right? Is that well I could do better I could do better on my own. And that, that's a common way to think about CPP is like look look at the rate of return you get on on CVP and look what I could have gotten investing in, you know, Nvidia, which is a terrible <laughs> comparison because that's one stock. But yeah, or you could have, or you could have invested in Arc funds. Yeah, you could have invested in Arc. <laughs> that that worked for a while, but yeah, not so well. Uh, so we, we we will talk about that. We will talk about the rate of return on CPP because as much as that's not, I don't think the best way to evaluate it. I think it is still one uh, one way to look at it. I, I think it's important to talk somewhat more qualitatively though about the the unique features and benefits of cpp because risk and return aren't just about investment risk like we can't just look at a rate of return and a standard deviation and say that assesses all facets of risk that's just not not the way that the world works so cpp offers protection against three risks that individuals are unable or it would be very hard for them to hedge on their own it protects against longevity risk the list the risk of living longer than expected I had a risk of living too long in my notes, but that sounds bad. People want to live long. <laughs> Risking, <laughs> is the, the risk is living longer than you planned to live for, and then you're in a position where you may run out of, run out of financial, um, the, the ability to fund your, your lifestyle. So that's one. Lo- protects against longevity risk. Uh, protects against inflation risk, and that's the risk of high inflation diminishing the purchasing power of your assets. And it protects against sequence of return risk. That's the risk of repeated poor returns, particularly early on in retirement, doing a lot of damage to your long-term spending outcomes. Those are three big risks for retirees, and CPP protects against all of them, which is valuable. So on longevity risk, again, it's funny to refer to this as a risk because people want to live long lives, long, healthy lives, hopefully. Um, But the reality is, the financial reality is that the longer we live, the more we need to have saved to have a successful retirement. Nobody wants to run out of money and eat uh, and eat cat food. No, exactly. Um, yeah. Right. Longevity risk, the risk of living longer than expected or living longer uh, and running out of money before you run out of taste buds. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, funny. If, if you run out of taste buds, then eating cat food's not so bad, I guess. That's, yeah. uh, that's good. So for, for longevity risk or, or um, uh, palate risk, I guess, uh, <laughs> p- pooled pensions like CPP or, or annuities like CPP, they deal with longevity in a different way than an individual can. It's a bit grim to think about, um, but instead of every individual needing to save more to fund a longer life, CPP lets people who die earlier than expected fund people who live longer than expected. That's called mortality pooling. And again, I know that's kind of grim. And it's also something people don't like about this. Like, well, I don't want to die early and help somebody else, but if you live long, then someone else helps you. Like that's just the way that these things. Ways, ways. And if work. you're dead, you're dead. So if you're dead, you're dead. And it's very efficient. Doing it this way is much more efficient than everyone having to save more and on average dying with a big pile of money left over. Uh, so that's mortality pooling. It's very, very efficient and useful. Um, nobody can do that on their own. A- any individual can't hedge longevity in the same way on their own. So because of the mortality credits, CPP will look increasingly attractive at longer life expectancies, and we'll talk about some of the numbers around that later. Yeah, and this gets back to some of the things we've talked about right at the beginning of this whole podcast series, you know, investing some time and money into good nutrition and exercise and other things that benefit your longevity might actually get you mortality credits too in the, in when it comes to CPP. So eventually you're, you're paid out of CPP, uh, or if you're able to obtain your own insurance, you might make a profit from that, I guess, by beating the odds. It. Yeah, CVP doesn't take mortality uh, expectations into account. Well, they do when they price the whole plan, but for any individual, they don't. Mm-hmm. For um, private annuities, they do They do uh, look at your health and stuff like that. Uh, but I think the only thing you can get is a, you can get a higher payout annuity if you can prove that you have a shortened life expectancy. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen a smaller payout annuity. I don't, like Nobody would ask for that. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there's asymmetric information with annuities. So the insurance company doesn't know how healthy you are. Um, anyway, this is, this is kind of off script and a little bit off topic, but if, if someone that there's potential for arbitrage, like a risk-free pop profit, if someone knows that they're very healthy for their age and knows that they have high longevity, 
they can choose, that, that person specifically can choose to go and buy an annuity because the insurance company is not going to assess their relative level of health. So there's a concept of biological age, someone who's biologically younger than their, uh, than their time-based age would at least statistically be better off buying, a, buying an annuity. So uh, it was just well, it's good to know my, my Garmin says I'm like six or seven years younger than I really am. So yeah, so you're a good annuity candidate. Yeah. <laughs> I guess the, the other thing there is that if people are really upset about CPP, it's an incentive to improve their uh, biological age, get healthier so That's they right. can get more out of <laughs> Financially motivating. Yeah. And then those, those types of lifestyle cho- uh, choices and, and, and other factors like that, they, they do import, impact more, mortality. Um, and they do figure into the return on investment when we're talking about this stuff. I, and this is particularly irrelevant. And this one, it doesn't feel great to talk about, but it's true. It's, it's in the data. Um, high income professionals with higher levels of education and socioeconomic status tend to live longer. Yeah. So they've got more longevity risk. So uh, if anything, it makes CPP a better investment for us because of that, that statistic. Yeah. yeah. And I, again, it feels kind of, kind of gross to talk about, but it's there, it's there in the data. It's, and the numbers are not small. People with more education, higher incomes live meaningfully uh, longer. So yeah, that's, uh, that's important. Um, yeah, it, it, the, the, the other thing that's worth mentioning is that asymmetric information that I mentioned about purchasing an annuity privately, that's cool if you can arbitrage it, but while annuity companies aren't able to assess your biological age, uh, when they sell you an annuity, they also they, they do kind of know. They kind of know that people who have higher longevity are going to be the ones that buy annuities. So when the insurance company prices their annuity product, they do take that into account. They do take it sort of like an adverse selection problem where people who expect to live long are going to be the ones to buy annuities. And so annuities have to, uh, annuity providers have to charge more for their product um, CPP though, because everybody has to pay into it, there's no adverse selection. It doesn't have that, that same kind of problem. Yeah. I mean, the the insurance companies, they're smart when they price their products, they look at all sorts of factors to make sure that that they're going to end up making the profits and not paying for more things than they expected to. It's what they do as a business. And we can buy insurance products to help mitigate longevity risk. We've talked about annuities. However, it's much riskier for an insurance company to take that that on, plus to also take on the inflation risk uh, that goes goes with that. I mean, if they were to try to do that, the price would be astronomical to account f- for them taking on that risk. At- attempting to maintain our buying pa- maintain our buying power over long periods of time is part of why you invest in stocks. Actually, risky assets like stocks and to a lesser extent bonds may provide sufficient long-term returns that outpace inflation in the long run. Unfortunately, though, they still do not offer a direct inflation hedge. It's kind of the best we can do, but it's not a direct inflation hedge. And when I say that, I mean that they do not necessarily uh, increase when inflation rises at the exact same time. And that can be a, a big problem for retirees. A little known fact is that the worst time to retire in U.S. stock market history was actually not 1929. That's what a lot of people would think. That was the period just before the massive um, market crash that and the, and the Great Depression. It was actually 1968, and that was a period with reasonable market returns, but it was also persistently high inflation. And you know, if you earn a 7% market return on your investments, but inflation's running 8%, you've actually lost money in real terms. And the thing about this, inflation also tends to have catastrophic effects on long-term real returns of bonds and cash. So those ap- assets are, are typically thought of being as safe. And as people think, well, I want to get mitigate my risk of running out of money or having a bad sequence of return, I'm going to use lots of bonds and cash. But they, they're not safe when it comes to inflation. They're particularly vulnerable. And the CPP benefit offers this indexing uh, to inflation. So each year, the benefit of those receiving CPP is increased based on the, the CPI all items index. So like longevity risk, inflation risk is extremely difficult for any individual investor to try to hedge with their investments. But CPP is in a much better position to, to deal with that since it's funded by many contributions and it has an extremely long time horizon uh, to realize those investment turns. They can smooth it out so they don't have to worry about all these little bumps 
along the way, which are little bumps for a, a, a pension with an infinite horizon, but they could be huge for someone who's facing 10 years of inflation or something. Yeah. And they can invest in other stuff that like the, the other thing is that there's a paper from Sebastian Batermier, who's a professor at McGill. He was on our on Rational Reminder podcast a while ago. He's got a relatively recent paper out looking at not CPP spe- specifically. He looked at three Canadian pension funds, uh, CPP being one of them, CPP investments. But he looks at examples where they were able to purchase, uh, I think, entire companies and then through uh, through their abilities as a massive asset manager, they were able to add significant value to the to that business uh, for their pension investors. And that's the kind of thing that like a person just can't do. No. So I think there's something in there too. Um, a, a, another underappreciated fact is that CPP contributions are increasing with wage growth, which is historically outpaced inflation. So when we're talking about contributions going into CPP being one of the reasons that it's able to withstand inflationary pressure. That, that That's one of them. That to the extent that wages are going to at least keep pace with inflation they've historically outpaced it that definitely uh that definitely helps and then cpp investments which is the, this crown corporation that exists at arm's length from the government but it, it invests the funds held in held by cpp um it, it can do the kind of stuff that i mentioned a second ago it can invest in these long-term illiquid assets which an individual just doesn't have the the capacity to do the other thing in there is that the investment management model employed by CPP Investments is is has been very successful at hedging its real long term liabilities. So one one of the there's often criticism that's like pretty casual criticism of like well you know the the costs of CPP are one percent I think, uh, which I think they are, which is a lot because it's a massive fund, um, and then people will say like well they could have done better investing in index funds, which is. I don't even know if that's true right now because their returns have actually been pretty good. Uh, but it's even if they've, say, matched the returns of index funds, that's not really the right way to assess the performance of a pension fund because the job of a pension fund is not to earn the highest rate of return possible. It's to hedge its real liabilities. So there's another paper that looks at that. They look at how well has CPP or how well have Canadian pension funds in general hedged their real long-term liabilities. And using the model that they do for investment management, they have been very successful. So I think that's another... Another thing that's worth mentioning there, uh, there's links to a lot of this stuff in in the footnotes, uh, the papers backing up uh, most of the stuff we're saying here. Uh, the, the other thing is uh, sequence of returns risk. So that's an, an individual investor gets one investment lifetime and the specific sequence of returns that they get can matter a lot. So you could have two people that get the same average return throughout their retirement but the sequence in which they earn those returns can have a material impact on their ability to spend in retirement. Someone who gets bad returns early on in retirement can be in, in a much worse position than somebody who gets strong returns early on in, uh, in retirement. And that can come from bad market returns, like the 1929 example. It can also come from high inflation, which I love that example, the 1968 in the US market example. That's the, the historically the worst time, worse than the big market crash to retire or realistically some combination of bad returns and high inflation. Those can cause sequence of return risk. But with CPP, the guaranteed income stream uh, plays a role in reducing those challenges of, of sequence of returns because it provides this baseline level of guaranteed income through bad market returns and high inflation. Yeah, I think put, put another way is that CPP can smooth the returns of many investors' lifetimes. So instead of having that one sequence that you get you have no single sequence it's a whole bunch of people are contributing and retiring at different times and then you spread out all of the your sequence risk across all of those different sequences across this big pool of participants so it reduces that impact on cpp as a whole you know, the, the other effect of a guaranteed income stream though is that allows individuals to take more risks with their other investments so if you are concerned about your risk and your return well if you have this relatively safe stream then you could possibly afford to take some more risk with your other investments without increasing your risk of financial ruin did for doing that now before we leave the topic of how cpp helps us with risk i just want to make one more comment about a couple of other risks that uh investors they can theoretically control them but it it's challenging in real life and one of those is behavioral risks so people think yeah i can do way better than cpp well 
it's it's different when you manage your own investments. We know there's that behavioral gap that's there. We talked about that in episode seven, where we're wired to buy and sell things at bad times, and that averages one or two percent a year uh, over over our lifetime. That could add up to a lot of money, uh, depending on on how you're investing. And the other thing is. CPP mitigates that behavior because you don't get to touch the investments. It forces you to invest regularly, not just when you feel like it's a good time to put money into the market. It has to be a regular thing. You can't touch the investments on your own. So it really kind of eliminates that problem for us. And the other risk that I've come to appreciate really as I interact with more people in retirement and even looking at our own spending is is sometimes if you have a lot of assets and you're going to be fine, there's you could still have a failure to spend. And it's hard for people to sell investments, uh, but it's relatively easy for them to spend income. You see it come in there, you spend it, You, especially if you're someone who's a bit of a saver. Well, those are the people likely to have big piles of assets. They have a hard time spending them down. Uh, And of course, that means they're giving up the use of that during their their lifetime. Whereas having this sort of regular income stream uh, that provides this safe floor may help you to spend some money uh, with more confidence from a behavioral standpoint. Now, and the amount of it, well, the CPP could be meaningful money in terms of people, uh, more some more than others. But even if it's a smaller amount of money relative to your overall portfolio, I think the psychological impact of that can can be disproportionate, just because it's it's coming in there regularly into your account. You see it, and you pay tax on it. You might as well spend it. Well, the, the numbers are getting big. Like, um, I'm about to do some math on the fly, which is never a good idea when you're doing a podcast. <laughs> but uh, the the new earning the, the new earning ceiling is higher, and then you're getting 33 percent of that as uh, as a potential future benefit. But if you run quick numbers on that, I'm, I'm not going to do the math because that's never a good idea. Like I said on a podcast. But if, no. if you if you do 33 percent of the new higher earning ceiling. And then take into account the fact that you can get a bonus for deferring CPP. And we'll talk about that in our episode on retirement planning. Um, but if, if if wage growth continues to be 1% above inflation, like it has historically, because the initial CPP benefit when you start taking it is based on, uh, is affected by wage growth. So when you take all that into account, you, you, it's a it's a 49.2, I believe, percent higher benefit if you defer from age 65 to age 70. And when you add all that up for a couple, uh, it, it could be like yeah. really big numbers. Yeah. No, it could be a decent amount of money to live on. For people with the enhanced benefits. That's for yes. people retiring in, in you know, four, 40 years from yeah, now. Yeah, way in the future. <laughs> yeah. So for now, it's relatively small. But in, in, in the long, long-term long distant future, for people who are saving today, the combined CPP benefit is going to be material for uh, for households. Yeah, which is but good. L- less so now. Yeah. Uh, still yeah, I mean, meaningful from a, but yeah but from a society standpoint to force that savings is going to be important because otherwise people fail to do it and if they fail to do it then society is going to have to try to support them the best they can yeah so it's for totally. everyone, everyone's I, I, better to, at everyone's benefit really yeah yeah, yeah. yeah this, this is one of the debates that i've had about cpp is that some people say that because of that because of what you just said mark it's a tax but it's like both things can be true CPP mm-hmm. is good at the individual level, and it is good for society. <laughs> yeah, doesn't have to be one or the other. But I, I, I tweeted a while ago as a somewhat of a of a joke, but also a lot of truth behind it. Um, I can't remember exactly what I said, but something about how you know everyone says that uh, they they would be better if they didn't have to pay into CPP. But then I showed this statistic on how much people have on average <laughs> saved for retirement, and it was like some tiny amount. Yeah. But anyway, to to your point, it's it's good for Good for everybody to have stable, secure um, retirements. To your point about spending, I can definitely tell you anecdotally that for retire- retired clients, having guaranteed income streams like CPP and old age security or and uh, guaranteed income supplement if it's applicable, they definitely punch above their weight. They punch above the weight of their, of their economic benefits when it comes to improving investor psychology with market returns, but also comfort with spending. People don't like to spend from their assets, um, but from an income stream, it's just psychologically different. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we've talked about kind of qualitatively the 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 unique attributes 
that CPP has. So with that in mind, I think the important question for an incorporated professional to ask is whether CPP is a good investment compared to the alternative of paying themselves the dividends and investing what would have gone to CPP in their corporation. Now, if, if CPP is deemed a good investment in that case, then paying into CPP is probably not such a bad thing. Definitely not a tax and probably not a reason to avoid salary. And that can materially affect the salary versus dividends decision uh, because uh, as we've mentioned, dividends avoid CPP contributions altogether and leave more money in the corporation to be invested. And I've heard this. It's not uncommon to hear people oh, yeah. uh, recommend the dividends only approach with the sole intent of avoiding, of, of avoiding CPP. Yep. Build a bigger corporation because you control right. everything. Yeah, yeah. So what, when we're making this comparison between paying the CPP and investing in a corporation, it's important, but not, not super easy to compare apples to apples. So we're going to kind of do our best here. Uh, if you compare paying into CPP to investing in an all equity portfolio in isolation in a corporation and assume like a guaranteed 7% return every year in your corporation, like clockwork, then you would expect a model to show that, that investing in your corporation is superior to CPP. And that's the kind of argument that I see all the time. That it comes back to that I could do better on my own. Um, why would I want to be forced to own this low risk thing, which is CPP when I could invest in stocks and, and, and make more money overall? I think th there, there are some major issues that this entirely misses and it can lead to some bad decisions. The first big one is that with stocks, yes, they have higher expected returns, but you're taking way more risk on, on multiple accounts. And I, I think probably more than is often appreciated by investors. The real long-term outcome of stocks is uncertain. There's lots of upside, yes, but historically, domestic stocks have around a 13% chance of losing purchasing power at a 30-year horizon. International stocks have around a 4% chance. Not, not immaterial at all. And if you start adding bonds into the mix there, the probability of losing purchasing power is even higher. CPP has no upside. You're not going to, you know, if the market goes crazy and does really well, you're not, you're not going to part participate in that with your CPP contributions, not directly anyway. It'll, I guess, help fund help fund future benefits. Um, but the downside of risk of CPP in real terms is pretty much non-existent, assuming CPP remains solvent and all that stuff, which is a whole other rabbit hole that we're not going to go down right now. Um, I, I think it's fine. Yeah. Uh, but CPP is there. It, it's it's a because it's an inflation indexed annuity. It is. I mentioned this earlier. It, it is the risk free asset for a long term investor. Uh, if, if we get a period of high inflation, cash and bonds, like you mentioned earlier, Mark, they'll tend to perform really poorly. But again, the CPP benefit is indexed to Canadian inflation and is in a position to weather the storm in those, uh, in those scenarios. So when you consider CPP as an asset, it's a, a, about as close to a risk-free asset as you can get in terms of, of risk-adjusted real returns. The second big variable <clears throat> that impacts how well the CPP, the CPP benefit does for you as, a, as an investment depends on when you take the benefits. I, I kind of alluded to this earlier. When you take them at 65, sorry, when you take them earlier than 65, uh, you get a penalty effectively. Uh, there's a maximum 36% reduction in your CPP benefit. Uh, statutory reduction, there's some interactions with wage growth in there too that can actually increase it more, but we'll, we'll leave that alone for now. Uh, and then... Uh, likewise, if you take it after age 65, there's a bonus, and that's a, up to a statutory 42% increase. But again, if you account for the effects of wage growth, it's actually can be a higher than 42% increase for deferring when you start your CPP, CPP uh, benefit. So those are those are big variables. And then how long you live for or what your life expectancy is, it's another big one. And then how high inflation is, is also going to affect how, how well CPP performs as an investment. If you... And I'm saying as an investment, like if we're just comparing the rate of return, which again, that's only one lens to think about this. But if you defer the benefit to age 70, as long as you can, live a long life and have high inflation during your retirement, CPP will be like the best performing asset you could have. On the other hand, if you take benefits early or don't live that long uh, or don't experience high inflation or maybe market returns are really high during your retirement, CPP can look lousy on a relative basis. But it's a totally different kind of risk. On the CBP side, it's like an actuarial risk. 
of how well your life lines up compared to the variables used to price CPP, totally different from financial market risk, which is a good thing. You want to have yeah, different diversi- types of risk. Yes, diversification. Totally, totally. It, it pays off in scenarios where other stuff won't. And other stuff pays off in scenarios where CPP won't relatively. Uh, the third issue uh, that, that we, we, we talked about this in previous episodes is that paying dividends to avoid paying into CPP has other tax planning consequences, a couple of them. Salary comes with uh, some tax credits that reduce the effective current costs of CPP. Uh, plus salary, and this is a big one, salary opens the door to RSP and IPP usage. You, you, you only get room to contribute to the RSP and the IPP if you've paid yourself salary in the past. There are also some nuances with tax integration for salary versus dividends that, that vary. And we'll talk more about that at the end of the segment because context there is, uh, is important. So we'll talk through some scenarios with uh, numbers later, but first we need to touch on that relationship between CPP and tax integration. Yeah, and this is really interesting, and it's something that's not well understood when you're considering the return on the investment of CPP is how much you're actually putting in to contribute to CPP. So as we mentioned earlier, the total maximum CTPP, CPP contribution in 2025 will be around $8,848. But this does not mean that you will save $8,848 dollars by paying yourself dividends instead. And this this isn't intuitive to people. There's two reasons why that is. One is that CPP contributions result in a combination of tax deductions and credits. So uh, we mentioned that a bit earlier that tax integration also favors salary over dividends. Those factors together make the effective cost of that actual decision of one versus the other using CPP and salary versus dividends only not not a one-to-one difference. So the 4.95% base CPP contribution results in a tax credit personally, which is worth the base credit rate. And in Ontario, that's about 20% of base CPP. The additional CPP contribution is a tax deduction at the personal level. So the value of that actually depends on your tax bracket. For example, in the top Ontario tax bracket, that deduction is worth 53 Five three percent. So you can imagine those credits and deductions reduce the actual cost that you're paying uh, to to contribute to CPP. Now on the corporate side, the employer CPP contributions are a deduction to the corporation, meaning that their value depends on the corporate tax rate because you're not going to be paying taxes on it. Uh, so they're not taxable to the corporation, not taxable to the employee, and this reduces the after-tax cost of the employer contribution. Uh, and the employee contribution when you put them together. So th- this is this is similar to other pensions. The employer contributions are pre-taxed. The personal contributions are only partially taxed. I mean, that's not fully pre-taxed like an RRSP or a regular pension, but it's not terrible either. And what this is is tax deferral, you know, that you defer that tax by not paying it now, and then you'll pay tax in the future when, when you get your benefits. So some of the personal contributions are pre-tax the 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 base mm-hmm. cpp is a credit so it's partial it's a partial offset but the the, the new enhancements the yeah. additional contributions those yes. are a deduction yeah so overall it's it's partially pre-tax but so, some of the newer ones are are fully deductible which is uh kind of nice, nice. And it yeah means that it interacts with your uh tax rate in terms of how costly it is to contribute to cpp uh so, so the, the the imperfect tax integration uh, inefficiency thing with dividends um, sh- should also be, I think, considered one of the costs of avoiding paying into CPP. And this is the thing that uh, Aravind Sith and Parapilli really uh, un- uncovered and, and kind of got me looking into, and him and I are, are, are looking at this together. But it's a, it's a really good perspective. So w- when you add up all of those credits and deductions, not even counting RFP and CPP room as a benefit, but when you just take the, uh, the benefits and deductions of contributing to CPP, Tack on the imperfect tax integration, um, that where it's, you're paying a little bit more tax for paying yourself dividends than than uh, salary. The net cost of contributing to CPP is a lot lower than the headline number makes it seem. Than the eight thousand eight hundred forty eight makes it seem. Or an alternative perspective is that the net cost of taking dividends to avoid CPP is a lot higher than I think people realize. Uh, so to prepare for this episode, we 
modeled a scenario where someone has a fixed amount of personal spending to fund. So he said, this person's lifestyle costs this much. I don't, I don't remember what the number was, but their lifestyle costs this much, no matter what. And they're deciding whether to fund that after tax living expense using salary or dividends. And in the salary scenario, they have to make their CPP contributions. In the dividend scenario, they retain the leftover earnings in their corporation relative to the scenario where they pay themselves a salary. So the salary, the overall cost is a little bit higher because of the CPP contribution. But in the dividend scenario, they retain the leftovers in the corporation. So this model really lets us see holding personal consumption needs constant, how much gets left in the corporation by paying dividends to avoid CPP, which is the question. So the result in, in, in our example, and I think we had a high personal tax rate here, uh, so the, the result was just under $6,000. So the, the punchline, and this is important, is that when well, well CPP is expected to cost that $8,848 number in 2025, someone in the highest tax bracket in Ontario, well, oh yes, it was the highest tax bracket, they would only be able to retain about $6,000 in their corporation by avoiding paying into CPP using dividends to fund their personal consumption. That $6,000 is before personal taxes too. It's $6,000 left in the corporation. And then the explanation for that, so why, why is it $6,000 that you save by avoiding CPP instead of 8,848? It's because tax integration slightly favors salary and there are deductions and credits related to CPP contributions. Yeah, so basically the bottom line there is the cost of salary and CPP is less than it appears on the surface. Now, looking at the other side of the, the question is, you know, the return on investment for CPP is actually often much better than what people think as well. So, I mean, I took a stab at that previously, and then you've modeled it as well uh, in a lot of detail here. Yeah. Yeah, I modeled the going in in a lot of detail. The coming out is is a little a little messier, but I, I think it still gets us to a, a useful place. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, we, we, we modeled... We modeled that that scenario, C- CPP versus dividends. We, we did a time, time series of that. So side by side over time, where do you end up with CPP in terms of accumulating the benefit in there versus where do you end up by retaining money in the corporation? Um, now, it's not going to be an apples to apples comparison. The reason being what we've talked about, CPP is an inflation index annuity and an investment portfolio in the corporation is not an inflation index annuity and we can't buy one to make the comparison really, really apples to apples. So it's a little bit rough. Um, w- one approach is to look at the internal rate of return on CPP contributions and and uh, and payments. That's that's the number that sets the present value of contributions and benefits equal. A higher IRR is going to suggest a better outcome for CPP. So starting with a case that's kind of representative of the average Canadian, the real IRR on base and additional CPP is around two point one percent, and that that assumes taking the benefit at sixty five living to 80, age 85. And that 2.1% is a, is a real return, that's important, that's after inflation. So you tack on inflation, it's a bit higher. And that number is not controversial. That's what the Fraser Institute finds in their modeling. Um, there's another, there's another uh, academic paper that found the same thing. And the Fraser Institute and that paper followed the same methodology, so it makes sense that the results are very similar. Uh, OSFI, the Office of, of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions, um, I had to go to the internet archive to find this one. It's not on the internet anymore. I love the internet archive for stuff like that. But they had a report uh, a while ago and they also found a 2% real IRR is the expectation for kind of the average Canadian paying into CBP. So anyway, all, all that to say that a 2% uh, kind of baseline return for paying into, into CBP, baseline real IRR is uh, not controversial and it's not, it's not bad. It's not amazing. It's not the expected return of a stock or of a diversified stock portfolio, but it's not bad. It's about the same as what government bonds have historically returned in Canada, but keeping in mind that CPP protects against high inflation and longevity, which government bonds do not protect against. So that's kind of the base case. Um, if we model uh, deferring the benefits to age 70, which like we talked about earlier, is uh, it, it's statistically likely to result in better outcomes, especially for people with high incomes and advanced education, because those are factors related to longer life expectancy. And we assume living to age 95, which is on the longer end of life expectancy, even for someone with those demographic characteristics, but just to illustrate the point, 
In that case, the real IRR on CPP is 3.11%. So not bad. And in that case, actually closer to the expected return on a 60% stock, 40% bond investment portfolio. Um, Investing in a higher stock allocation would have a higher expected return uh, and, and might be more tax efficient, but it's also more risky. Yeah. I mean, if the, if you live that long and are fortunate that way, you're making a really great return relative to a portfolio with much more risk and without that risk. So a risk-adjusted return would be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the, the, the other thing, uh, I think we might have mentioned this earlier, but having CPP there, yeah, we did mention it, or you mentioned it, Mark. Um, having CPP there lets you take more risk with your other investments. So like... A comparison, and there, there's research on this. Uh, on, actually, yeah, there's, we'll have this in the footnotes too. Um, comparing stocks to an annuity doesn't really make sense because there's actually an optimal combination, theoretically, of stocks and annuities that gives you a better expected outcome than stocks alone. So to look at just an annuity versus just stocks doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The real comparison should be some combination of stocks and annuities compared to uh, stocks or compared to stocks and bonds. And what the research tends to show on that is that because the annuity is hedging uh, other risks that stocks can't hedge, you get a better expected outcome by combining the two. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So, I mean, that's one way of looking at it with those rates of return. The other way is, you know, how could I try to get as close to a risk-free asset like CPP is as as possible. I mean, you could try to invest the retained corporate earnings of government bonds during the accumulation years and then buy an indexed annuity at the age that you'd collect uh, CPP as an approximation. That's how I tried to estimate it, and I came up with 2% as well. So we came up with exactly the same area. Yeah, your, your post on this was was good. It was, it was a good way to, to think about it. Um, but like we talked about earlier, early, you can't buy an inflation index annuity. You can buy an index annuity, which are more expensive than non-indexed annuities, but it indexed is indexed to a fixed percent, not inflation. So it's not really an inflation hedge. Um, so with all that said, if we had invested retained earnings in the corporation and purchased an annuity with 2% indexing at age 70, the real interest rate required during accumulation to match the IRR of CPP would be way higher than what bonds have actually returned historically. So I took I took CPP, and then beside that I took retaining the amount the, the thing we talked about earlier with if you pay yourself dividends, the, the six thousand dollars or whatever number that ends up being left over, retaining that in the corporation, and investing it, and then we go forward in time to age sixty five, and so on one side we can start CPP, on the other side we have a pot of money, and we're going to buy an annuity. So I took annuity pricing for a 2% indexed annuity, which again, that's fixed indexing, not actual inflation indexing. If it were inflation index, it would be a lot more expensive to buy. But I took the pricing of that annuity and then solved for the interest rate that you would have had to earn in the corporation in order to fund that annuity. And it was, I don't remember what the number was, but it was much higher than the return on on bonds. So I, I thought that was a good indication that CPP is not really a bad deal if you kind of try and make a somewhat risk appropriate comparison if we if we compare if i put stocks in there which are more tax efficient and have higher expected return then again we get back to maybe you, you could yes do better without cpp but that doesn't mean that you're better off without cpp just because you could do better potentially um one thing i do want to acknowledge and this comes up a lot is that it is true that paying into cpp and dying early results in a bad financial outcome. You could have made your heirs better off or your surviving spouse better off, depending on the situation, if you had all of that money in a bank account or or in a corporation invested. That is true. The death benefit's $2,500. It's not indexed to inflation. It hasn't changed. That's not great. That's completely true. There, There are spousal survivor benefits. They vary, though, depending on uh, when death happens and what the spouse's own CPP situation is. So there can be cases where the survivor benefits are pretty good. There can be cases where they're, they're really, they're really not great. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, those benefits may seem small, but I can tell you from personal experience that the impact may be more than what you think. It's kind of mm-hmm. like insurance seems like an expense until you need it unexpectedly. 
Like, for example, if the main breadwinner dies very young and there's a young child in the mix there, the CPP child benefit kicks in really quickly. And that regular income stream, when the surviving parent is trying to find their feet again amongst all the turmoil, can really actually have an outsized impact. Yeah, that's a good point. There are disability benefits too. Like there's a bunch of stuff with CPP that I don't think Mm -hmm. gets enough credit. It's a pretty good, overall pretty good program. Yeah. And the whole point of this is, should you avoid paying salary to avoid CPP? And I think that, you know, the answer is probably no. (laughs) No. Uh, Some people do worry about CPP getting kind of rated by the government or, or boondoggled like we see with other government spending initiatives. But CPP investments is run as an arm's length entity uh, it's arm's length from the government. It's a crown corporation. The government can legislate changes to CPP, so it's not like they're completely hands off, but it's uh, th- there's some some separation there. And as of the last report, which was September 2023, uh, from the office of the chief actuary, uh, the the pension CPP is well funded, and it's projected to fund 75 years of its future obligations in its current steady state meaning the current level of contributions and stuff like that are, are in a good position to, to keep this thing going uh, the way it's set up right now. So I, I think the management of, of CPP investments has been pretty good. I think that the current legislative setup for it is pretty good, as the actuary reports tend to show. So the main threat could be maybe political interference. Um, some of the stuff we're seeing with Alberta, stuff like that. Yeah, stuff could happen. It's it's a pretty tough role for a politician to hold, though, to start touching things like CPP benefits. It's going to be a big, big, big voter blocks that are going to be affected by that if they try to do anything. So there'd be a lot of political uh, motivation to, to make it work out well. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, another important point in our modeling is that we, we did assume that all, all refundable tax uh, was recoverable. So if, if RDTOH is not recoverable because of corporate bloat, the retained earnings strategy would be less attractive than, I didn't give any quanti- quant- uh, numbers there a minute ago, but um, it would look worse than in my example that I talked through. Uh, so whether that's going to be an issue or not depends on on your province and your longer term plan. Mark, I know you've done some some modeling with that aspect, meshing CPP in with other corporate and personal investment options. Yeah, I think you have to look to, together with the whole plan with, with everything else that we've talked about. So when I look at this, when you're asking, really what you're asking the question is about paying is paying dividends only to avoid CPP as an investment and invest that money corporately instead. We have to put that into the context of the longer term planning that goes on. So the basic question is whether the difference between CPP return versus let's say all equity investments uh, in, in a corporation, is that larger than the loss the impact of the loss of those other planning benefits. So even if CPP in an all equity portfolio were an apples to apples comparison, does a few percentage points more return on 6K per year retained in the corporation make up for a lower return on 9K roughly invested via CPP? And also does that corporate investment and corporate tax uh, deferral make up for the tax deferral and tax sheltering of using RRSPs, which if you're going to be paying yourself salary, you would likely be using that as well as part of your plan. So then there's also the issue of tax integration, which you mentioned about how does that play out if it's tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars of active business income that's being subjected to the issues of tax integration, not just a few dollars flowing through. And then how does that change over time uh, when you're trying to pay money out of the corporation to fund your consumption? So I did take a look at this, and I used our optimal compensation algorithm, which we spent uh, the re- the last episode talking about in detail about you know how how we worked that out. It's very similar to what uh, Ben and Braden did in the IPP page paper. The main difference is that I used RRSPs rather than IPPs, and I used a DIY ETF low cost portfolio uh, rather than uh, looking at the fees, uh, assuming that they would be the same to run an IPP. So I use those kind of low-cost DIY strategies. And one of the features of our dynamic salary strategy is that you usually start with mostly salary. And then you shift over to dividends as the corporate passive income starts to become large because you're trying to clear out all of those notional accounts. 
uh, like your RDT OH uh, as things things grow. So it becomes important as to when or if that happens. Uh, and that depends on your income and your consumption because that'll affect how much you're saving in the corporation. But it usually translates into you not contributing to CPP for your full career. You contribute to what, during those salary years and then gradually over time uh, move over to dividends. And then at the end, you're left with some income stream that's from CPP, which would be smaller, uh, but it's still proportional to however much money you put into it. So the way that I tried to handle that in my modeling is I treated CPP as, an, as like an account, uh, a pension account essentially, and tried to factor in its value uh, into the comparison. So I plugged in the, the CPP internal rate of return of about 2% a year uh, as the base case, which is, as we've just finished talking about, seems to be pretty reasonable. It's going to depend on when you die. It could be higher if you live a long time. It could be lower if you die younger. But that's the so-called kind of average Canadian that's been studied a bunch of times. So for the money invested personally or in the corporation, I used a globally diversified ETF portfolio with a 7% per year nominal return. So that's about a 5% real return after inflation of 2%, which is how I modeled it. And that's roughly the historical market returns over the past 100 years uh, when you look around the globe, including the U.S. market, which does dominate uh, data sets. So I also tested it in different provinces and at different income and consumption levels. Uh, I think that's important. You can't just look at everything at the top tax bracket in Ontario. I did it in different provinces, different consumption levels, which means you're going to be having different tax brackets uh, playing into the equation. And in doing that, there, uh, there was really one obviously important factor. And that's that in Ontario and New Brunswick, there's that anomaly in the tax integration where making too much passive income in a corporation uh, is actually a good thing as long as you're spending uh, the money to keep keep the, the notional accounts flowing out of it. So it, it bumps part of the taxes up to that higher general corporate tax rate, but not all of it. And yet you get to pay out eligible dividends as if the corporation had paid more tax. So it ends up being more efficient. And when that happens, it does benefit a dividend only strategy. Uh, more because that what happens is you end up retaining more money in the corporation. It exceeds that 50k limit faster, and then you end up taking advantage of that tax anomaly uh, faster and for more more years. So, for example, in Ontario, a corporation that makes five hundred thousand dollars a year before owner salaries, a dividend only strategy could come out ahead over the 35 year uh, time period that I was studying. However, that does require that the government doesn't close that integration anomaly in the future. I mean, for a thir that seems pretty unlikely to me, especially over a 35-year mm -hmm. time period. I wouldn't be betting my plan based on uh, a, a tax anomaly. And the other thing I would say, it also requires that you're spending about $150,000 a year or more. So the intent of the passive income limits was to penalize people keeping a bunch of money in their corporation and not spending it. So even though there is that tax anomaly, it, it still actually accomplishes that objective because if you aren't paying money to your corporation, then it is actually a very big penalty. Mm -hmm. But if you do pay the money to your corporation, it, it's, it's using a carrot instead of a stick. Now, I did look at this also in other provinces which don't have that broken tax integration, and they all show pretty much uh, the, the same same results. So if they don't have broken that break in tax integration or even at more modest uh, consumption levels in Ontario and New Brunswick, the benefits of using an RRSP and the tax integration benefits of salary overpowered the lower return of CPP compared to equity investing via corporations. So if, yes, the return on CPP would be less, but because of all those other tax sheltering benefits and the cost of it being relatively less than what you think, it ends up that that's more important uh, than trying to avoid paying into CPP by avoiding salary. That's kind of the bottom line. Now, uh, when I looked at more moderate income level corporations, like say $300,000 a year of income, if you spit, hit really high spending levels with that, like $150,000 of personal spending, uh, it could be possible for a dividend-only strategy to come out ahead the, under that circumstances. But when you're getting into that close 
of a of an amount between the corporate income and the personal spending it's actually kind of questionable whether you should be incorporated at all because you know you really you could just be using your your registered hmm. accounts you're not actually saving much money uh in the corporation so you have to kind of really manipulate it uh to come out that way so what I would say overall is if you live longer than that, so I did do some sensitivity testing as well. If you live longer than that, then, you know, any of those advantages of of trying to avoid CPP disappear because the internal rate of return of CPP then goes up because you lived longer and it wipes out those benefits of, of using dividend only strategies in, in those sort of very specific uh, cases. Again, I would say this highlights the the apples to oranges comparison because equity investing is going to be much more investment risk involved whereas cpp is this risk that's based on your longevity more so uh, than the investment returns so it's how long you live and that's important to look at it the other way too so the other thing i did to do as a sensitive test is let's say i assume that you died at age 65 without collecting cpp you have no survivor to benefit from your pension so basically you've contributed into cpp and you get no return on those contributions at all. And while the magnitude of the benefit of using salary was less, it still came out ahead because of the tax integration uh, benefits compared to uh, use and being able to use your RRSP uh, compared to just using a dividend only strategy. That's wild. Yeah, that, that's that's big. That's a big finding. Yeah, I think it's important because you, when you talk about this. I think what happens is people look at one year of taxes and they right. look at one year of taxes plus CPP. How many dollars do you have left compared to if you just pay dividends only and it comes out well, dividends only, you pay less tax and CPP now. So you have more money now to invest, but it's partially taxed and it's not tax sheltered. Mm. Whereas the RP, RSP is tax sheltered growth. And when you look at that over longer periods of time, that's more powerful than a small amount of money difference right now yeah that's that's super interesting i like that yeah i thought it was pretty cool all right so the take-home message is that cpp is not an investment with lots of potential upside uh, but it is a rare chance for canadians to buy into a truly inflation indexed annuity which is valuable it's also less costly than most people realize once all the tax effects are considered you're basically buying a stable lifelong income stream that adjusts for inflation, which is useful, a, a useful hedge against longevity risk as well. Also, the dollar amount is often not not high compared to the rest of your retirement drawdown plan. So I, I wouldn't let CPP payments dissuade you from using uh, using salary. As Mark mentioned, the, the other benefits of salary are usually larger than the difference between CPP and equity, equity returns, even if it were an apples to apples risk comparison. I mean, let, let that sink in. That's, a, that's such a cool finding that we talked earlier about how, yes, it looks like you could do better with stocks. But when you take into account the fact that paying salary also gives you RSP, which you can fund with investments, that actually offsets that, that advantage. So even if there is a higher return, the after-tax return, maybe not so much. So with the possible exception of when taking uh, advantage of a few tax integration anomalies in Ontario and New Brunswick, um, but betting on those persisting for long enough um, to, to say that avoiding salary is a good idea is probably unwise. Yeah, and I think the other thing that I didn't mention with my modeling that's important is when you talk about the after-tax value over time, well, all I did is I discounted it at a relatively steady rate drawing down for retirement. I didn't try to do a tax-efficient drawdown sequentially and strategically using different investment accounts. And the other advantage of an RRSP and other accounts is not only the tax sheltering benefits, it's actually being able to strategically draw from different pots at different times to try to optimize your consumption and what's left over at the end. So I think that's something that would probably make the benefit even a little bit more, but it gets pretty complicated because it's very, very situation uh, specific. Mm. Okay, I think it's time. We let, let's move on to employment insurance. And this is something I thought was going to be boring and not really tell us much, but it actually is really interesting. And there's some really important, actionable bottom lines to this section. 
Yeah, I, I went into this similar to you, having kind of written EI off, but I think there's some, like you said, some really interesting stuff in here. So employment insurance is optional for self-employed people. Uh, when an employee controls more than 40% of a corporation's voting shares, or if the employee is a family member of someone in that situation, their earnings are not insurable under the EI program. However, self-employed workers in these situations can choose to opt into the EI program with the caveat that they do not qualify for regular EI benefits. What does that mean? Regular benefits are for people who lose their jobs through no fault of their own, like due to shortages of work or seasonal layoffs, and are available for and able to work but can't find a job. That's when you look on like Reddit and stuff like that. So that's what people are usually asking about when they ask about EI. They got laid off or something like that. So not having access to those regular benefits makes EI seem somewhat less appealing for self-employed individuals. And it leads to the common advice to simply not opt in, which both of us kind of thought before we dug into this. Uh, but there are multiple special benefits that self-employed people who opt in to the program are able to access. And the other interesting thing is that self-employed workers do not have to pay the employer's portion of EI premiums. So unlike CPP, where you pay both sides, with EI you don't. And the employer premium for EI is actually 1.4 times the employee premium. So as a self-employed individual, you just pay the employee premium. So that reduces the total cost of participating by <clears throat> more than 50%. Now the catch, sort of, and we'll dig into the sort of in a sec. The catch is that once a self-employed person has opted in and used one of the benefits, they're then required to continue paying EI premiums when they take salary as compensation forever. Forever, sort of. And that's, again, we're going to come back to that later. Yeah, I think a common point of confusion with that is if you make a claim as an employee prior to being self-employed. And if that happens, that actually doesn't count. For example, if you took an EI-supported parental leave while you're an employee, such as for the common situation I'd encounter as a resident physician, then when you later on become self-employed, you actually you're starting fresh. So at that point, when you're self-employed, you can choose to opt in or, or not. It's not that you, because you took a, a leave as an employee that you're now committed. Now let's talk a little bit about how much you actually pay. So EI premiums are payable on insurable earnings based on a contribution rate that is set by the office of the chief actuary each year. So the, in 2024, the rate is 1.66%, and the average rate for the last 20 years is 1.75%, so it's very similar. The 2024 insurable earnings are $63,200. So meaning that above that income level doesn't require you to pay more EI and premiums on top of that. So in dollar terms, the maximum employee contribution in 2024 is $1,049. So that's the maximum that you could be expected to pay. And again, that's much less than what someone who has to also pay the employer contribution would have to pay. We don't have to pay that as self-employed people. Now, the EI insurance uh, earnings are tied to wage growth. And uh, that was mentioned previously that wage growth has historically outpaced inflation. So it's not that it's indexed to inflation. It's probably 1% uh, per year higher than that annually, if you look historically. Uh, so the premium, the benefit could outstrip inflation slightly over time. The effective cost of the EI premium, kind of like how we talked about with CPP, is is reduced, actually. it's It's not even that $1,049. It's going to be less because it also creates a basic tax credit. And again, that's worth about 20% of the premium paid in Ontario and reduces the net amount by that amount. So instead of $1,049, it's effectively closer to $850 uh, when you account for the fact there's a tax credit that comes with it. Right. So we mentioned earlier that as a self-employed person, you're not eligible for regular EI benefits. But let's talk about the EI special benefits that, that self-employed people do have access to. Uh, so there are six special benefits that, that self-employed people can, can access. Um, they include maternity benefits. That's for people who are away from work because they're pregnant or have recently given birth. Parental benefits, which is distinct from maternity. Parental benefits for parents who are away from work to care for their newborn or newly adopted child. And those two, uh, maternity and parental, can be combined. Sickness benefits are for people who can't work for medical reasons. The family caregiver benefit for children covers people who provide care or support to a critically ill or injured person under the age of 18. The family caregiver benefit for adults, similar, covers people who provide care or support to a critically, uh, critically ill or injured person over the age of 18. 
And then the last one is the compassionate care benefit, which is uh, for people who provide care or support to a person who requires end of life care. So a whole bunch of different programs that, that people have access to. The benefits are based on 55% of insurable earnings and the maximum number of weeks for each special benefit varies. To receive benefits, the amount of time you spend on your business has to have decreased by more than 40% for at least one week. And you have to have been registered in the self-employment program for at least 12 months. And you have to have earned a minimum amount of net self-employment earnings between January 1st and December 31st of the year before you apply for benefits. So for example, to be eligible for benefits between January 1st, 2024 and December 31st, 2024, you need to have made at least $8,492 in net self-employment earnings in 2023. Yeah, so the question then is, you know, when does it actually make sense uh, to opt in to EI? So since it's optional and you can choose to opt in at, at some point, you know, it's potential to get access to that variety of benefits uh, beyond what we'd usually think about. So for a self-employed person, these would be the main potential attraction. However, the benefits can come at the cost of paying those EI premiums on salary. So once you've opted in and used any of the benefits, you're required to continue paying premiums when using salary. So you have to look at the net between the cost and the benefit. And, you know, when would that make sense? Yeah, so I think an interesting thing about EI is that you only have to be registered in the program for 12 months before taking benefits. So you got to pay your premiums for 12 months before taking benefits. So that, that means you could... Pay the premiums for, for a year, so that's the $1,049 in 2024, and then received full benefits for maternity and parental leave the following year. So we looked at a case with one year of maxed out employee EI premiums, followed by 50 weeks of maternity and parental leave benefits at 55% of the maximum insurable earnings, and then followed by 38 years of maximum EI contributions after that, which are, like we mentioned, once you've taken the benefit, you have to pay those premiums going forward. So we compared this to not opting into EI and paying a dividend out of the corporation to match the after-tax income, uh, the after-tax income of the EI benefit in the year when the leave is taken, and so that that also means in the dividend case no future EI premiums. So t- taking the benefits later is less compelling than this example because in this example we're we're paying premiums for a year and then taking benefits right as soon as possible. But I think someone planning to have children could opt into EI a year in advance of starting to take the benefits rather than starting to pay premiums earlier and then uh, and then using the benefits much later. And then the other thing is every additional child, so we're talking about taking one leave, one parental and maternity leave, every additional child makes opting in look better. And then also it's not just about paternity and, and uh, or maternity and parental leave. Um, but there's also all the other benefits. So using, having more, more than one child and using the leave or having uh, other leaves for other reasons makes all of the math look um, much, much better very quickly. So we're really just talking about one leave right now. Uh, so t- t- taking benefits early in life also has a larger impact on the benefit because of when the cash flows happen. So for example, if you pay $1,000 into EI and then collect $34,000 the next year, that's a massive upfront return on your investment. In the alternative scenario of funding the leave with dividends, there's a huge opportunity cost on the money used to pay the dividend. That's whatever it is, $34,000 plus dollars that you could have left invest in your corporation, taking advantage of tax deferral and, uh, and, and growth in the corporation. With EI, you then repay over time with future premiums, but that ends up being less costly than the opportunity cost of having paid that big upfront dividend. So it's kind of like getting an upfront low or no interest loan, sort of, and then repaying it slowly over over decades. So how, how beneficial it is to have the money saved and invested in the corporation by using the EI benefit is going to be, in the end, a function of the after-tax expected return of funds left in the corporation. Yeah, so we'll come back to that some more. But I would just, just say, in my case, personally, I actually didn't opt into EI. I took short unpaid parental leaves. My wife took two maternity and parental leaves as she was employed outside of our corporation and she also had an employer top up. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because everyone's situation is going to be different. It's also something that you should explicitly talk about as a couple rather than assuming it's going to be this or that. Mm -hmm. You know, maternity benefits are only available to the person who gives birth and parental benefits are additive to that and they can be shared 
between the parents. So a birthing female, for example, may decide to collect maternity benefits, but if her partner has a lower income or maybe uh, even a top up from work, it could make the most sense financially for their partner to take parental leave funded by EI following that. And in the case of physicians, there are also some other interactions that could happen because there's other programs that are potentially available. For example, in Ontario, there is a pregnancy and parental leave benefit program for up to 17 weeks. And taking federal EI would actually subtract from that so that it, that enters into the equation. And that applies even if it's taken before or after that uh, provincial benefit. You now, in contrast, a non-physician partner may not face that issue. So the physician on the provincial program can they can make some income. They can do some light work and earn up to thirteen hundred dollars a week before the benefit starts to get clawed back. But that could factor into how much work they're going to do, what their partner is going to do, and try to balance that out together. There's other programs in other provinces, but you just have to be aware of the interaction. And the final point that I'd make about deciding who takes what leave is that it isn't just about the math. It is one of those times to consider your values and preferences. Uh, that we started talking about in the earlier episodes. You, you may opt to take both take time together. There may be uh, different family or cultural factors that come into the equation, and you know that may add support or it may also add other pressures as well. So for the other thing I'd say as a professional or a business owner, taking extended time away from your business or your practice, raises other practical challenges as well. So you'd want to be thinking about all these things in advance and discussing it together to help not only plan the financial part, which is what we're talking about here, but to decide better how to deal with some of those non-financial aspects as well. Yeah, some of those interactions with other uh, other, uh, benefits that may be available is is definitely important. But I, I really like that point about, like, should you even be taking a leave as a in, in, in your specific situation as a as a professional or a business owner um, I I'm not self-employed so I'm not I wouldn't have that opt-in decision to make but I, I if I were in that position knowing what I've done for our past kids we've got four kids I'm not having any more but I know what I did for each one and I think uh, I took two weeks off for one of them and that was the most of any uh, so I, for me, it probably would not have made sense to opt into, uh, opt into EI. And I never took like officially time off, uh, time off work yeah. with reduced pay or anything like that. Well, I think one of the things with the physicians face too, is we could potentially, you know, work even a couple of shifts or a couple of days here and there to keep our skills and also make enough money doing that, that it starts to overpower the EI benefits anyways. So like I say, it really depends on your situation. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the main point that we're making though, is that the, if it would be plausible and sensible for someone to take leaves, the financial aspect can actually look pretty good, which is yeah. not what people generally believe. Um, the, 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 the added ben- added additive benefit of maternity plus parental leaves may be one factor to consider at the time of having children. Uh, another issue beyond kids, hopefully further in the distant future, is that having paid NDI could help uh, if other caregiver benefits are needed down the road, like for caring for an aging parent. And uh, th- 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 this brings up another another factor for business owners. If, if you're not incorporated, you have to pay NDI for the rest of your career, assuming that you keep earning income. If you are incorporated, As we've talked about in the last few episodes, including this one, you have a choice about how to pay yourself between salary and dividends. You're required to continue to pay into the EI program once you benefit from it when you pay yourself salary. But as as we have been talking about, you don't have to always pay yourself a salary. And the other thing that, and this is, uh, this was your thinking, Mark, it's really, it's it's like brilliant, honestly. We've talked about how when you're incorporated, um, you will likely start with a high salary. This is the dynamic salary concept. You'll start with a high salary early on. And then as the notional accounts start to get larger, you'll start shifting more toward a dividend salary. So the a dividend income, sorry. So the salary component of your total income will decrease over time, eventually potentially being even, uh, even zero when it gets completely dominated by emptying out the notional accounts. Now that's interesting 
because it interacts with what we're talking about with the uh, with the EI premiums. U- using dividends only for compensation totally eliminates your EI premium. Yeah, and that, to me, this was a this was a big big deal because you're taking what we you know we assume is going to happen. You pay you pay in EI for the rest of your career, but when you actually put it, put it together with a dynamic compensation plan like what we've been talking about you could actually be only paying into the EI premiums for a short period of time as you move into dividends only it may be much much less than that 39 year horizon that you'd used in in the earlier modeling so what i did is i actually took that and i bolted EI benefits and premiums into my simulator to compare using our dynamic salary compensation type strategy uh, with or without opting in to EI and then comparing how that looked like uh, after a 35-year time frame. So when you start to switch to that dividend-only strategy, it really impacts uh, the results. So otherwise, I kept the model parameters all the same as I did with the CPP modeling, but we really wanted to see what's the difference between opting in or not opting in uh, to EI. Now, the basic message is that an incorporated business owner who saves a lot in their corporation uh, by making much more than what they spend, they're going to have an even larger benefit uh, from opting into EI uh, because they're going to be using dividends for a larger proportion of their their career, even if they use salary early on. So I'm just going to illustrate that with a couple of quick examples. For example, there's an Ontario corporation making $500,000 per year pre-owner salary income and then they're going to fund hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year of consumption the owner's salary would shrink below the maximum ei insurable earnings level of sixty three thousand dollars and start to switch over to the dividend only strategy by about 15 years so that's much much shorter of a window of contributions but you still get the same benefit uh, in the model a corporate active income was reduced to zero uh, for the re- for the duration of the leave so you weren't making active income for however long the leave was, and I did test different lengths of leave. For example, if they contributed for one year and then took a 52-week leave, there would be that $34,760 benefit, so basically $35,000, and there'd be no active business income in that year because they took a full 52 weeks. And then there's that leaves you with a funding shortfall, and that funding shortfall would be made up by using dividends Uh, from the retained earnings from the corporations from previous years. Now, in the model that I used, since I was assuming we just opened business, contributed for one year, we didn't have any retained earnings beyond that. And if you did exceed uh, what you had retained, you'd have to use a line of credit with 5% interest to bridge that gap. And in that sort of worst case scenario, it did mean taking a $25,000 loan uh, in the opt-out strategy temporarily to fund that that gap which you would then pay back as soon as possible which actually was was less than a year and in the model so it, it it's i did it just to be thorough but i don't think it really actually impacts the findings at all and uh, in the ei opt-in strategy uh the br- bridge the bridge gap uh was done uh, with more taxable uh income so you pay out, you get your benefit, you pay out some dividends or whatever on top of that, like you would normally, depending depending on the leave. Anyway, the, the final difference is large enough that those little nuances probably don't matter. I would just give you kind of the bottom line. At the end of the 35-year simulated period, the net EI premiums were paid as $12,500 over about 15 years. After that, it was dividends only. The EI benefit was $35,000 in year two. Now, that seems like a, a $20,000 difference when you just look at it at face value. However, as we talked about, for when you get the benefit also matters. So the difference of that early benefit resulted in $44,000 more after tax assets compared to opting out of EI when you looked at year 35. And the reason why that is is that extra money that was retained and invested in the corporation early on because you use an external benefit, it that extra amount of money early on compounds over decades. And accounting for that massive return from an early opportunity cost from foregoing the EI benefit, if you were trying to look at different durations, it actually ends up being that a six-month uh, EI-funded leave was the break-even point uh, 
in that model. So you didn't need to take a full 50 weeks of, of parental leave. Six months was enough uh, to break even uh, because of, of the hmm. not only getting the same benefit for less premium, but getting it early so that it could then the savings could then compound over time. Now, as as been described earlier, it makes sense when you consider how big of a difference compounding makes. Paying into EI for 14 years and then taking a leave instead of taking the leave up front reduced the advantage so much that the opt-in advantage actually disappeared. So, mm. in fact, a, fu- a full 52-week leave after 14 years of contributions would actually have be slightly worse off uh, than having not opted in earlier and then taken well opting at the same time but taking the leave up front so taking a leave late really made it less appealing because of that compounding Hmm. it's crazy stuff man because you take take the the whole idea of dynamic salary which is is kind of something that we've been working on collectively for about a few years i guess just in terms of thinking about how that all works and then you start going downstream what other decisions does that affect and this is such a great example where EI, you could maybe argue that it makes sense if you're going to pay yourself a salary forever as a self-employed person, if you're going to use the benefits. But the example you just walked through, when you take the full picture into account, including dynamic salary, it's like, it makes a ton more sense financially yeah. to take EI if you're going to use even a little bit of leave. So it really, it really changes financial planning when you start thinking about, we've talked about this in past episodes, when you think about the full big picture of life cycle financial planning, um, it really changes your perspective on stuff. Oh yeah, and it shows just how small difference at the beginning makes a huge difference later on. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think EI has practical implications for families and and financial planning at, at least to the extent that you can actually plan for when kids come in the picture, which can sometimes be easier said than uh, said than done. <laughs> um, but you you could choose to not opt into EI, and then at least a year before you start trying or or start moving in that direction, you could opt in. And if things go well, uh, you'll likely come out ahead if you use the, the benefits. And if not, you can, and you don't have kids, you, you can, uh, and, you, and you don't claim, then you can just opt out because no claims were made in, uh, in that case. So I, again, I think this highlights discussing in advance what you plan for parental leaves and by which partner in the relationship could really inform the financial planning around DI opt-in. And this also highlights one of the things we've mentioned many times communicating stuff like this to your financial planner if you're working with one or to your accountant if you're working with one. Um, plans like, life plans like that can really inform optimal financial planning strategies. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, and the other thing I would say, I, I, did, I should mention is that I did try this at different uh, amounts of income and consumption. You know, I know there's gonna be people saying, yeah, who makes $500,000 a year? And who spends one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year? I mean, most people are challenged on both ends of that equation. So I did actually run the numbers as well with a corporation that had three hundred thousand dollars of income and one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars of spending. I didn't make it tighter than that because then, as I had mentioned earlier, if you start getting really tight, then it doesn't make sense to be incorporated anyway. But that was about as much as I could push that envelope. It's leaving about fifty thousand dollars a year in the corporation. Uh, if you're using other accounts. So I wanted to be somewhat realistic. I also used BC this time too, just to be different. So uh, it, that's an important difference because as we talked about before, there's this tax integration anomaly in Ontario, New Brunswick, that could make a dividend only strategy a little bit better at times if if it doesn't get closed or changed. Anyways, with that sort of BC scenario with more moderate income and spending, there was still about a $30,000 advantage to opting in if you took a 52 week parental leave a year after starting contributions into it and at that lower income level there were also less retained earnings uh, in the corporation so the sort of side effect of that is the corporation uses salary uh, for much much longer because they don't start getting into trouble trying to empty out their notional accounts due to requiring enough dividends so in that situation the corporation owner would use a salary uh, for the whole 35 years because they haven't built a large corporation requiring a lot of dividends uh, to fund their spending on top of their salary. Still, though, that amounted to $29,000 paid in and $35,000 paid out, which you may sound, okay, well, that's really close. But 
it's the upfront payout that makes the big difference because you paid that $29,000 in over 35 years, but you got a $35,000 payout in year two. And the opportunity cost of having had to use your corporation instead for that means that, that it's much better. Now, due to the premiums being more, it being closer, the break-even point isn't six months uh, or 20, 26, a 26 week uh, break even uh, like it was with the higher income, but still a 40 week break even. So you'd have to take 40 weeks or more of parental mm-hmm. leave at that more moderate level uh, to break even rather than if you'd opted out. Mm-hmm. So it still works. All right. So that's it for EI. So I think we can move on to our post op debrief. In, in this episode, we covered CPP and EI, which are the two payroll deductions that may come with paying a salary. CPP will, EI may. CPP is required. EI is uh, initially an opt-in, but becomes mandatory once you've used any of the benefits. We showed that CPP is not a bad deal for business owners relative to employees, and that it comes with a unique set of benefits. Yeah, the CPP benefit offers protection against three big risks that individuals struggle to deal with in retirement. The inflation risk, sequence of returns risk, and longevity risk. And this makes it a value part of an overall accumulation strategy and a retirement strategy. At the very least, it means that it's not something that should people go out of their way to try to avoid. Yep, that's a big ticket. You can d- disagree on whatever bits and pieces, but overall, it's not a... Not a tax, I guess. That's the that's the yeah, big. It's not worth avoiding, and even if it was, it's not worth avoiding it. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Right. With the uh, with interaction with the uh, tax deferred account creation. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and uh, yeah, so related to that, avoiding CPP by paying dividends is more costly than I think many business owners realize for for a few reasons. CPP contributions result in credits and deductions, which reduce its overall upfront cost. Tax integration favors salary slightly over dividends, which means that there is an additional integration cost borne by anyone paying dividends to avoid CPP contributions. And like Mark just mentioned, paying salary creates RSP slash IPP room, which is advantageous in its own right. Yeah. Um, Moving on to EI. EI is not mandatory for business owners. It's an opt-in. But uh, if you opt in and use any of the benefits, you're also required to contribute moving forward. If you have paid into EI for 12 months prior to using the benefits and met all those other criteria, uh, it can be useful to you. Still, it's common advice to avoid EI if you're self-employed, but our modeling suggests that this blank advice may not always make sense. Opting into EI and then taking a leave after 12 months can be beneficial by allowing dollars to stay invested in the corporation. That comes with the cost of ongoing EI premiums after the initial leave, but the alternative is a large opportunity cost on the corporate dollars used to fund that leave. Yeah, and even if you get fewer overall dollars from EI than what you paid in, the timing of the large initial benefit and smaller ongoing benefits makes EI potentially attractive uh, for anyone who's realistically going to take a significant leave from work. And the other important thing we found in modeling this is related to what we talked about in the last episode on dynamic salary. Yeah, this is such a cool point. And in, in many cases, optimal spending plans are going to start with salary and then increasingly consist of dividends as notional accounts in the corporation get larger over time. From the perspective of EI, this means that the required lifetime premiums will decrease over time as compensation shifts toward dividends. So cool. Yeah, very cool. Pulling it all together. Yeah, no, I love it. I love it. Uh, it's a, it's a very cool like uh, systems optimization kind of problem. Okay, so that's it for our episode on CPP and EI. We, we do want to say at the end of this episode that we probably won't be back with an episode next week at the time that this episode comes out because uh, I think we mentioned this in the last episode too. We, we, we created ourselves a lot of runway to do, uh, to do prep for, uh, for these episodes after our initial chunk of recordings. We realize that that runway is not sufficient to continue doing the quality of work that we want to do. Um, these last three episodes were, um, I don't know, intense, intensive. It was a lot of a lot of thinking and work and time went into them. Oh yeah, I mean, and that's the thing that when you get into these complicated topics and you realize a lot of stuff hasn't really been looked at, then we kind of start looking at it, which consumes a lot of 
a lot of our time and effort to really try to model it out well because you have to build the models run them through interpret it run it by other people yeah. to see make sure it makes sense yeah yeah that and that's a big piece of it that we, we've been very deliberate about because we're doing the stuff that's you know we're not reading out of a textbook there's a lot of stuff here that's legitimately new planning so we've been pretty deliberate about running it by other people with expertise to make sure that the stuff we're saying is accurate and uh and makes sense anyway all that to say that we have some big episodes coming up big in terms of the the size of the topic and and the the depth that we plan on covering them in but for that reason uh we, we won't be back next week uh we don't have uh we don't have a a deadline for when we're gonna get the next episode out we'll uh, we'll get to it as, as quickly as we can, but uh, just a heads up that yeah. you shouldn't expect an episode next week. I would also say it's fair to say that these long episodes are super duper long, packed full of information. So, you know, if, if you're feeling itch, itchy about it, you can always go back and look at and, at some of them again and look at the look at moneyscope.ca where we have the transcripts. They're all indexed uh, by topic uh, so you can try to digest it in some different ways we know this whole series we're doing is going to be something that people have to listen to and come back to repeatedly so this might be an opportunity to revisit and start digesting some of that material there's a, a lot there yeah definitely and we'll be back uh whenever we're back soon but yeah, soon. determined not, not not determined yet yeah well we'll keep plugging away at it we're having yeah, fun definitely. so we sure are <laughs> all right thanks for listening <laughs>